Chapter 7, Part 3 of The Wee Freeman. She slid down the dry dirt and feagles scattered in the cave below as she landed. When her eyes got accustomed to the gloom once more, she saw that the galleries were crowded with pixies again. Some of them were in the middle of washing, and many of them had, for some reason, smoothed down their red hair with grease. They all stared at her as if caught in the act of something dreadful. We ought to be going if we're going to follow the queen, she said, looking down at Rob Anybody, who had been washing his face in a basin made out of half a walnut shell. Water dripped off his beard, which he had braided up. There were three braids on his long hair now, too. If he turned suddenly, he could probably whip someone to death. Ah, weel, he said. There's just a wee matter we got so, sort of settle out, Kelda. And he twiddled the tiny washcloth in his hands. When Rob anybody twiddled, he was worried. Yes, said Tiffany. Uh, will you not have a cup of tea? said Rob anybody. And a pixie staggered forward with a big gold cup that must have been made for a king. Tiffany took it. She was thirsty after all. There was a sigh from the crowd when she sipped the tea. It was actually quite good. We stole a big bag of that from a peddler who was asleep down by the high road, said Rob anybody. Good stuff, huh? And he patted down his hair with his wet hands. Tiffany's cup stopped halfway to her lips. Perhaps the Pixies didn't realize how loudly they whispered because her ear was on level with the conversation. Ah. She's a wee bit on the big side, no offense to her. Aye, but a kelda has to be big, ye ken, to have lots of wee little babbies. Aye, fair enough, big women is all very well, but if a laddie was to try to cuddle on this one, he'd have to leave a chalk mark to show where he left off yesterday. Ugh, and she's a bit young. She needn't have any babbies yet then, or maybe not too many at a time, say. No more than... Ten babbies at a time, maybe. Crivens, lad, what are you talking about? Tis Rob anybody she gon' choose anyway. You can see the big man's poor wee knees knocking from here. Tiffany lived on a farm. Any little belief that babies were delivered by storks or found under bushes tend to get sorted out early on if you live on a farm, especially when a cow is having a difficult calving in the middle of the night. And she'd help with all the lambing when small hands could be very useful in difficult cases. She knew all about the bags of red chalk that the rams had strapped to their chests and why you knew later on the ewes, the ewes which of the red smudges on their backs were going to be mothers in the spring. It's amazing what a child who is quiet and observant can learn. And this includes things that people don't think she's old enough to know. Her eyes spotted Fion on the other side of the hall and she was smiling in a very worrying way. What's happening, Rob, anybody? She said, laying the words down carefully. Ah, weel, that's the clan rules, ye ken, said the feagle awkwardly. Ye being the new Kelda and, and weel, we're bound to ask ye, see, no matter how we feel, we, we gotta ask to mutter, mutter, mutter. And he stepped back quickly. I didn't quite catch that, said Tiffany. Oh, we've scrubbed up nice, ye ken, Rob anybody said. Some of the lads actually had a bath in the dew pond, even though it's only May. And Big Jan washed under his arms for the first time in his life. And Daft Wooly, well, he picked ye a bonny bunch of flowers. Daft Wooly stepped forward, swollen and nervous with pride, and thrust the aforesaid bouquet into the air. They probably had been nice flowers, but he didn't have much of an idea of what a bunch was or how you actually picked one. Stems and leaves and dropping petals all stuck out of his fist in all directions. Very nice, said Tiffany, taking another sip of tea. Oh, good, good, said Rob anybody, wiping his forehead. So maybe you'd like to tell us, mutter, mutter, mutter. They want to know which one of them you're going to marry, said Fion loudly. It's the rules. You have to choose or quit as Kelda. You have to choose your man and you have to name the day. Aye, said Rob, anybody, not meeting Tiffany's eye. Tiffany held the cup perfectly steady, but only because she suddenly couldn't move a muscle. She was thinking, ah, this is not happening to me. 
can't. I mean, he couldn't. We wouldn't. But they're not even. This is ridiculous. Run away. But she was aware of hundreds of nervous faces in the shadows. How you deal with this is going to be important, said her second thoughts. They're all watching you, and Fionn wants to see what you'll do. You really oughtn't to dislike a girl who's four feet shorter than you, but you sure do. Well, this is very unexpected, she said, forcing herself to smile. A big honor, of course. Aye, aye, said Rob Anybody, looking at the floor. Well, and there's so many of you, it would be so hard to choose, said Tiffany, still smiling. And her second thought said, he's not happy about this either. Aye, it will that, said Rob anybody. I'd just like to have a little fresh air while I think about it, said Tiffany. And she didn't let the smile fade until she was out of the mound again. She crouched down and peered among the primrose leaves. Toad! she yelled. The toad crawled out, chewing on something. Hmm? he said. They want to marry me. <laughs> what are you eating? The toad swallowed. A very undernourished slug, it said. I said they want to marry me. And? And? Well, just, just think. Oh, right, yeah, the height thing, said the toad. Well, it might not seem like much now, but when you're five feet seven, he'll be six inches high. Don't laugh at me. I'm the Kelda. Well, of course, that's the point, isn't it? Said the toad. As far as they're concerned, there's rules. The new Kelda marries the warrior of her choice and settles down and has lots and lots of feagles. It would be a terrible insult to refuse. I am not going to marry a feagle. I can't have hundreds of babies. Tell me what to do. Me? Tell a Kelda what to do? I wouldn't dare, said the toad. And I don't like being shouted at. Even toads have their pride, you know. And he crawled back into the leaves. Tiffany took a deep breath, ready to shout, and then closed her mouth. The old Kelda must have known about this, she thought. Mm. So she must have thought that I would be able to deal with it. It's just the rules, and they just don't know what to do about them. None of them wanted to marry a big girl like her, even if none of them would admit it. That's just, those were the rules. So there had to be a way around this. There had to be. But she had to accept a husband, and she had to name the day. They told her that. She stared at the thorn trees for a moment. Hmm she thought, and she slid back down the hole. The Pixies were waiting nervously, every scarred and bearded face watching hers. I accept you, Rob anybody, she said. And Rob's face became a mask of terror, and she heard him mutter, Ah, oh, Crivens, in a tiny voice. But of course, it is the bride that names the day, isn't it? said Tiffany cheerfully. Everybody knows that. I, said Rob anybody, quavering, that's the tradition, right enough. Then I shall. Tiffany took a deep breath. <sighs> At the end of the world is a great big mountain of granite rock, one mile high, she said. And every year, a tiny bird flies all the way to the rock, and he wipes his beak on it. Well, when the little bird has worn down that mountain, down to the size of a grain of sand, that is the day I will marry you, Rob anybody. Rob's terror turned to outright panic, but then he hesitated, and very slowly, he began to grin. Aye, a good idea, he said slowly. It does not do to rush these things. Absolutely, said Tiffany. Oh, and that would give us some time to sort out to the guest list and all that, said the pixie. That's right. Oh, plus there's all that business with the wedding dress and buckets of flowers and all that kind of stuff, said Rob anybody, looking more cheerful by the second. 
I mean, that sort of thing can take forever, can't it? Oh, yes, said Tiffany. But she's really just said no, Fionn burst out. It would take a million years for that bird to... She said aye, Rob anybody shouted. You heard her, lads. She named the day and that's the rules. No problem about that mountain neither, said Daft Wooly, still holding out the flowers. Just you tell us where it is and I reckon we could have it doing faster than any wee little birdie. It's got to be the bird, yelled Rob anybody desperately. Okay, the wee birdie. No more arguing. Anyone feeling like arguing will feel my boot. Some of us have got a wee laddie to steal back from the queen. He drew his sword and he raised it in the air. Who's coming with me? Well, that seemed to work. The Knack McFeagle liked very clear goals. Hundreds of swords and battle axes and one bunch of battered flowers, in the case of Daft Wooly, were thrust into the air and the war cry of the Knack McFeagle echoed around the chamber. The period of time it takes for a pixie to go from normal to mad fighting mood is so tiny it actually can't be measured by the smallest clock. Unfortunately, since the pixies were very individualistic, each one had his own cry, and Tiffany could only make out a few over the din. They can take our lives, but they cannot take our trousers. You'll take the high road, and I'll take your wallet. There can only be one thousand. Ach, stick it up your trackings. But the voices gradually came together in one roar and shook the walls. Nay, king, nay, quinn, nay, laird, nay, master, we will not be fooled again. And this died away. A cloud of dust dropped from the roof, and then there was silence. Let's go, cried Rob anybody. And as one feagle, the pixie swarmed down the galleries and across the floor and up the slope to the hole. In a few seconds, the chamber was empty, except for the Gonegal and Fionn. Where have they gone? asked Tiffany. Ach, they just go, said Fionn, shrugging. I'm going to stay here and look after the fire. Someone ought to act like a proper Kelda. She glared at Tiffany. I do hope you find a clan for yourself soon, Fionn, said Tiffany sweetly, and the pixie scowled at her. They'll run around for a while, maybe stun a few bunnies and fall over a few times, said William. They'll slow down when they found out that they don't ken where they're actually supposed to go. Do they always just run off like this? asked Tiffany. Ah, well, Rob anybody does not want to talk too much about Marion, he said, grinning. Yes, we have a lot in common in that aspect, said Tiffany. She pulled herself out of the hole and found the toad waiting for her. I listened in, he said. Well done, very clever, very diplomatic. Tiffany looked around. There were a few hours to sunset, but the shadows were already beginning to lengthen. Well, we'd better be going, she said, tying on her apron. And you're coming, Toad. Oh, well, I don't know much about how to get into, said the Toad, backing away. But Toads can't back up easily, and Tiffany grabbed him and put, her in his, her, put him in her apron pocket. She headed for the mounds and stones. My brother will never grow up, she thought as she ran across the turf. That's what the old lady had said. How does that work? What kind of place is it where you never grow up? The mounds got nearer. She saw William, and not as big as medium-sized jock, but bigger than wee jock jock, running along beside her, but there was no sign of the rest of the Knack McFeagal. And then she was among the mounds. Her sisters had told her that there were more dead knights buried under there, but that had never frightened her. Nothing on the downs had ever frightened her. But it was cold here. She never noticed that before. Find a place where time doesn't fit. Well, these mounds were history, and so are the old stones. Did they fit here? Well, yes, they belonged to the past, but they'd ridden on the hills for thousands of years. They'd grown old here. They were just a part of the landscape. 
The low sun made the shadows lengthen, and that was when the chalk revealed all its secrets. At some places, when the light was right, you could see the edges of old fields and tracks. The shadows showed up what brilliant moonlight couldn't see. So Tiffany made up the word noonlight. She couldn't even see hoof prints. She wandered around the trilithons, which looked a bit like huge stone doorways, but even when she tried walking through them both ways, nothing happened. Well, this wasn't according to plan. There should have been a magic door. She was sure of it. A bubbling feeling in her ears suggested that someone was playing the mouse pipes. She looked around and she saw William the Gonagal standing on a fallen stone. His cheeks were bulging and so was the bag of the mouse pipes. She waved at him. Can you see anything? She called out. William took the pipe out of his mouth and the bubbling stopped. Oh, I, he said. The way to the Queen's land? Oh, I. Well, would you care to tell me? Oh, I didn't need to tell a Kelda, said William. A Kelda would see the clear way herself. But you could tell me. I. And you could have said, please, said William. I'm 96 years old. I'm not a dolly in your little dolly house. Your granny was a fine woman, but I'll not be ordered around by a wee little girl. Tiffany stared for a moment and then lifted the toad out of her apron pocket. A wee chit of a girl. What does that mean? She said. It means something very small, said the toad. He is calling me small? I'm bigger on the inside, said William, and I dare say your dad wouldn't be happy if a big giant of a wee girl came stamping around ordering him a boot. Well, the old Kel Kelda ordered people about. Aye, because she'd earned her respect, the Gonagal's voice seemed to echo around the stones. Please, I don't know what to do. Tiffany wailed. William stared at her. Ach, well, you're not doing too bad so far, he said in a nicer tone of voice. You certainly got rob anybody out of marrying you without breaking any of the rules. You're a game lass, I'll give you that. You'll find the way if you take your time. Just don't stamp your foot and expect the world to do your bidding. And you're, all you're doing is shouting for sweeties, you can, so use your eyes, use your head. He put the pipe back in his mouth, puffed his cheeks until the skin bag was full, and made Tiffany's ears bubble again. Well, what about you, Toad? said Tiffany. You're on your own, I'm afraid, said the Toad. Whoever I used to be, I didn't know much about finding invisible doors, and I resent being press gang too, I may say. But, but I don't know what to do. Is there like a magic word I should say? I don't know. Is there a magic word you should say? Said the toad and turned over. Tiffany was aware that the Knack McFeagle were turning up. They had a very nasty habit of being really quiet when they wanted to. Oh no, she thought. They think I know what to do. This isn't fair. I don't have any training for this. I haven't even been to witch school. I can't even find that. That opening has to be around here. There must be clues. I just I don't know what they are. Well, they're watching me to see if I'm any good. And if I can be good at cheese, well, maybe that's all. But a witch deals with things. She put the toad back in her pocket and felt the weight of the book, Diseases of the Sheep. And when she pulled it out, she heard a sigh go up from the assembled pixies. They think words are magical. She opened the book at random and frowned. Cloggets, she read aloud. Around her, the pixies nodded their heads and nudged one another. Cloggets are the trembling of the greaves in hoggets, she read, which can lead to inflammation of the lower pasks. If untreated, it may lead to more serious condition of sloke. Recommended treatment is the daily dosing with turpentine until there is no longer either any trembling or turpentine or sheep. She risked looking up. The feagles were watching her from every stone and mound. They looked impressed. However, 
The words in diseases of the sheep cut no ice with magic doorways. Ah, Scrabbity, said Tiffany, and there was a ripple of anticipation. Scrabbity is the flaky skin condition, particularly around the lollets. Turpentine is a useful remedy. And then she saw, out of the corner of her eye, a teddy bear. It was very small. It was the kind of red you don't quite get in nature. And Tiffany knew what it was. Wentworth loved teddy bear candies. They tasted like glue mixed with sugar, and they were made of 100% artificial additives. Ah, she said aloud, my brother was certainly here. That caused a stir. She walked forward, reading aloud about Gargit of the nostrils and the staggers, but keeping her eye on the ground. And there was another teddy bear, green this time, and quite hard to see against all that turf. Okay, thought Tiffany. There was one of those three stone arches a little while away. Two big stones with another one laid across it on top of them. She'd walked through it before and nothing had happened. But nothing should happen, she thought. You can't leave a doorway into your world that just anyone can walk through. Otherwise, people would wander in and out by accident. You'd have to know it was there. Perhaps that was the only way it could work. Fine, then. Then I'm just going to believe this is the entrance. She stepped through and saw an astonishing sight. Green grass, blue sky becoming pink around the setting sun, a few little white clouds late for bed, and a general warm honey-colored look to everything. It was amazing that there could be a sight like this. The fact that Tiffany had seen it nearly every day of her life didn't make it any less fantastic. As a bonus, you didn't even have to look through any kind of special stone arch to see it. You could see it by standing still practically anywhere. Except something was wrong. Tiffany walked through the arch several times and she still wasn't quite sure. She held up a hand at arm's length, trying to measure the sun's height against the horizon. And then she saw the bird. It was a swallow hunting flies and a swoop took it behind the stones. And the effect was odd, almost upsetting. It passed behind the stone and she felt her eyes move to follow the swoop, but it was late. There was a moment when the swallow should have appeared and it didn't. Then it passed across the gap for a moment and was on both sides of the other stone at the same time. Seeing it made Tiffany feel that her eyeballs had been pulled out and then turned around. Look for a place where time doesn't fit. The world seen through the gap is at least one second behind the time here, she said, trying to sound as certain as possible. I think, no, I know this is the entrance. There was some whooping and clapping from the Knack McFeagle, and they surged across the turf toward her. That was great, all that reading you did, said Rob anybody. I did not understand a single word of it. Aye, it must be a powerful language if you cannot make out what the heel is going on about, said another pixie. You definitely had the makings of a Kelda, mistress, said not as big as medium-sized jock, but bigger than wee jock, jock. Aye, said daft Wooly. It was smashing the way you spotted them candies and then you didn't let on. We didn't think you'd see that wee green one either. The rest of the Pixies stopped cheering and turned to glare at him. What did I say? What? He said. Tiffany sagged. You all knew this was the way through, didn't you? She asked. Oh, I said Rob anybody. We ken that kind of stuff. We used to live in the Queen's country, you ken, but we rebelled against her evil rule. And we did that, and then she threw us out on account of being drunk and stealing and fighting all the time, said Daft Wooly. It wasn't a like that at all, roared Aunt Rob anybody. So you were just waiting to see if I could find the way, right? Said Tiffany, before a fight could start. Aye, and ye did well, lassie. Tiffany shook her head. No, I didn't, she said. I didn't do any real magic. I don't know how. I just looked at things and worked them out. 
It was just cheating, really. The Pixies looked at one another. Ah, well, said Rob anybody. What's magic, huh? Just waving a stick and saying a few wee magical words? And what's so clever about that, huh? But looking at things, really looking at them, and then working them out? Well, now that is a real skill. Aye, it is, said William the Gonagall, to Tiffany's surprise. You used your eyes and you used your head, and that's what a real hag does. That magic in here is just for advertising. Oh, said Tiffany, cheering up. Really? Oh, well then, there's our door, everyone. Right, said Rob anybody. No, show us the way through. Tiffany hesitated and then thought, I can feel myself thinking. I'm watching the way that I'm thinking. So what am I thinking? I'm thinking, I walked through this arch before and nothing happened. Oh, but I wasn't looking then. I wasn't thinking either. Not properly. The world I can see through the arch isn't actually real. It just looks as though it is. It's sort of a magical picture there to, to disguise the entrance. And if you don't pay attention, well, you just walk in and out of it. Ah. She walked through the arch. Nothing happened. The Knack McFeagle watched her solemnly. Okay. I'm still being fooled, aren't I? She thought. She stood in front of the stones and stretched out her hands on either side of her and shut her eyes. And very slowly, she stepped forward. Something crunched under her boots, but she didn't open her eyes until she couldn't feel the stones anymore. And when she did open them, it was a black and white landscape. <laughs>